All right, welcome back. Hope you're having a fantastic week. Today we're continuing our RBT exam practice question series. We're going to the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and most importantly, subscribe. If you're looking for our proven study materials, please check out btexamreview.com. We've helped thousands of RBTs pass with our practice exams, our study guide, and of course, our famous combo pack. Questions, comments, let us know. Work hard, study hard. Let's get to our questions. Question one, a student receives reinforcement continuously whenever they answer a question correctly. The client is now answering questions routinely. To start to strengthen and maintain this behavior, what should happen? This appears to be a maybe a DTT procedure. Uh, we're clearly in the skill acquisition phase because we are delivering continuous reinforcement. With continuous reinforcement, we're typically teaching a skill because every single response is getting reinforcement, which is great at the beginning. But as they learn the skill, as the learner learns the skill, what needs to happen? Well, that skill has to start to strengthen and then has to maintain and generalize. Continuous reinforcement is not an effective way to maintain and generalize behavior. What do we need to do to start moving away from continuous reinforcement into other strategies built on strengthening, maintaining, and generalizing behavior? What should happen? A, continue to use continuous reinforcement. If you continue to use continuous reinforcement, once you start fading it later, it's going to be more difficult to change the reinforcement schedule. Ideally, as soon as they start to display the behavior you want to see, we should start fading out reinforcement because we want to start strengthening that behavior and then on to maintenance and on to generalization. Constant use of continuous reinforcement is counterproductive. B, begin fading the reinforcement. Yes, after you've used continuous reinforcement to teach a skill, the next step is you start fading out that reinforcement. C, implement a response cost. A response cost is just a punishment procedure. There's no indication we need a punishment procedure here. Actually, it seems like the client is doing quite well, so we need to continue reinforcing. We just need to fade out the reinforcement. And then D, implement differential reinforcement. We don't need an extinction procedure quite yet. We're just focused on this one skill, and now we want to strengthen and maintain that skill. In order to do that, we've got to fade out from continuous reinforcement to other types of schedules of reinforcement. Ideally, maybe something variable, maybe even a variable ratio schedule. But as you continue to use FR1 schedules, you're continuing to teach the behavior, but you're not really strengthening or maintaining it because every single response is receiving reinforcement, which is not what occurs in the natural environment. So to strengthen and maintain behavior, you have to begin fading the reinforcement out. A college professor is teaching an advanced engineering course in the spring. On the first day of class, he gives an ungraded quiz to everyone in the class and evaluates the answers. The professor is most likely gathering what kind of data? This is a little bit of a tricky question. It's very applied, but you have to think a little bit. First, what is the question asking? The question wants to know what kind of data is the professor gathering? Because the professor is obviously using this ungraded quiz for, for a reason. And what reason is that? Well, let's look at it. He's teaching this course. The quiz is ungraded on the first day of class before anything is taught. There's no grade. He's essentially just collecting data on his students, what they can do, what they can't do, what they know, what they don't know. So if we're collecting this data on where the learners are beginning before intervention starts, what is that called? A, survey data. Well, a quiz isn't a survey. He's not getting their opinions, okay? He's actually giving them quizzes and grading them and evaluating the answers. B, ABC narrative recording data. Is the professor recording any antecedents or consequences? He's not. He's taking the quiz. He's then evaluating those answers to determine where are my students starting on the first day of class. C, event recording data. Event recording data is essentially frequency data. It's just how many times something occurred. He's not taking account here. He's not looking at how many times something occurred. What he's looking at is D, baseline data. What is baseline data? Baseline data is the data that we take before intervention starts. It's where the learner begins. 
in this case, the college professor is figuring out where are his students beginning before I even teach them anything. And by giving this ungraded quiz on the first day and evaluating the answer, he's not assessing, he's not giving them a grade, he's not teaching them anything. He's just getting a baseline. So when he does start teaching, he can see what kind of change is being made. So the professor is most likely gathering what kind of data? D, baseline data. During a group training session, the trainer tells the RBTs that they first need to identify what evoked the behavior. What does the trainer want to want the RBTs to identify? So the key word here is going to be evoked. So what does the trainer want the RBT to identify? Well, they need to identify what evoked the behavior. And what do we mean by this word evoked? Evoked essentially is saying this thing caused the response, right? It's not the same as the function, right? It's not the same as, as uh, the, the maintaining consequence. What evoked the behavior is our antecedent. So an antecedent happens right before, and the behavior happens in response to the antecedent, and then a consequence determines whether or not that behavior happens again in the future or if it doesn't happen again in the future. So antecedents evoke behavior, behavior happens, and then the consequences either maintain or decrease the behavior. So if the trainer wants the RBTs to identify what evoked the behavior, the trainer wants the RBTs to identify A, antecedents. Yes. If this said the trainer wants the RBTs to identify what maintained or punished or decreased the behavior, we would be talking about consequences. If the trainer wants the RBT to identify why the behavior occurred, right, uh, whether to gain attention, whether to gain, tan gain a tangible, we'd be dealing with functions. And then in a prompt is just a cue, right? So if the, R the trainer wanted the RBTs to identify a cue that evoked the behavior, we'd be talking about prompts, okay? And then prompts are technically antecedents. So broadly speaking, the trainer wants the RBTs to identify what evoked the behavior, meaning what came before the behavior, meaning the trainer wants the RBTs to identify antecedents. Antecedents is a better answer than prompts. A BCBA designs a new differential reinforcement plan targeting a client's jumping jack behavior. As the RBT implements the plan, the client's mom tells the RBT they do not think the plan will work. The RBT agrees. What should the RBT do? You might find yourself in this situation as an RBT, especially in a home environment. You, as do RBT, you're in the house a lot. You're around the parents a lot. You become oftentimes uh, very close to the parents, right? And they trust you. Sometimes they trust you more than the BCBA just because they know you better. However, you, you must maintain a professional relationship. Remember your role as the RBT. And in this case, your BCBA implemented a new plan. The mom tells you, or the mom tells you that they don't think the plan will work. Even you, the RBT, might agree with that mom. What should you do in this situation? It's a plan. Parent says, I don't think it's going to work. You agree. What do you do? A, express your concern to the client's mom and tell her to reach out to the BCBA. Should you tell the mom that the plan isn't going to work? No, that is not your role as DRBT. As DRBT, you're there to implement the plan. The BCBA designs the plan. They train on the plan. Now, you can tell her to reach out to the BCBA, but you can't just say, well, I don't think it's going to work either. Remember, you're part of a team with your BCBA. B, ask the mom how she would like to change the plan and relay that information to the BCBA. Again, is that your role as the RBT to start changing plans? It's not. Not At least not until you talk to your BCBA. The problem with A and B is you're taking it upon yourself before even speaking to the BCBA. First thing you have to do is communicate with the supervisor. That's in the ethical code. C, tell the mom that you need to implement for at least a week before any changes can be made. This isn't a bad answer, right? Because you don't want to just immediately start changing things. However, you still haven't done what? You still haven't directed the mom to the supervisor, which is where they should be going. Any questions like this outside your scope, outside your competence, outside your training, needs to be directed to the supervisor. So the first thing you should do here is tell the mom 
to consult the BCBA. Once they do that, then you can get with your BCBA, explain the situation, and your BCBA will provide you guidance. But you shouldn't immediately start expressing your own opinion on it or giving guidance or changing things. We have to get with the supervisor first. So in this case, what should the RBT do? D, direct the mom to the BCBA. You're an RBT who is dating someone about to sit for their BCBA exam. The day before the exam, you break up. They end up passing their exam and start working at the same place you work. Are they allowed to supervise you? The BCBA or the BACB ethical code has very strict regulations on sexual and romantic relationships. Friendly relationships between supervisors and RBTs aren't really defined. Romantic and sexual relationships are defined from clients to BCBAs to RBTs. So in this case, what is happening? Well, we need to know, can the BCBA supervise you? We know you are dating this person, but you break up, so you're no longer dating them. They then become BCBAs and start working where you work. Can they supervise you? A, yes, as long as they completed all supervision requirements. While they do need to complete supervision requirements, is there a time that needs to, an amount of time that needs to pass before they can supervise you? Yes, there is. Very specific length of time. B, no, you cannot receive supervision from someone you used to date. You can receive supervision from someone you used to date, but a certain amount of time must pass. So C, yes, as long as they wait six months to supervise you, that's the answer we're looking for. They have to wait six months to supervise you. Six months has to pass and you to before they can supervise you. And then D, yes, as long as they wait two years to supervise you. Two years is the client rule, okay? So this is just something you just kind of need to know, right? Yes, they're allowed to supervise you, but a certain amount of time must pass before they can. And of course, they have to complete supervision requirements. So the answer is C, yes, as long as they wait six months to supervise you. What are you not allowed to share on social media regarding your clients? So with the new ethical code guidelines, they become extremely clear on how they feel about social media. What do they say? Are you allowed to share pictures as an RBT on social media of your clients? You're not, even with permission. Are you allowed to share videos on your personal social media? You're not. Are you allowed to share written information? Absolutely not. You should never share confidential information, definitely not written confidential information, on your social media. The VACB ethical code is now very, very clear on what can't be shared on social media. What the ethical code says is you are not allowed to share anything regarding your clients or on your personal account, including pictures, videos, and written information. So what are you not allowed to share on social media regarding your clients? Well, D, all the above. Which of the following measurement procedures are not considered continuous when observing behavior? Be careful here. A little bit tricky, right? So we are asking about a measurement procedure, continuous measurement procedures when observing behavior. So these we're looking for the one that is not continuous and when observing behavior. So A, rate. Is it continuous? Yes. Do we observe behavior? Yes. So rate is a continuous measurement used when observing behavior. Seems great. B, permanent product. Is permanent product continuous? Well, not technically. Permanent product kind of lives on its own, okay? Second, do we observe behavior with permanent product? Most of the time, no. We don't have to. That's one of the advantages of permanent product. With permanent product, we're not so much concerned about the behavior. Rather, what did that behavior produce? What came as a result of the behavior. That's what we're more concerned with. With a permanent product, we don't need to observe the behavior and it's not technically continuous. C, latency. Is latency continuous? Yes. Do we observe behavior? Yes. And then D, into response time. Is it continuous? Yes. Do we observe behavior? Yes. So which of the following measurement procedures are not considered continuous when observing behavior? It's going to be B, permanent product. You, an RBT, decide to enroll in a master's degree program and pursue your BCBA. Once you finish your classes, you start telling your clients that you are a BCBA, but you have not passed your exam. What ethical code are you violating? The BACB is very serious about this. 
They do not want people misrepresenting themselves as BCBAs, BCABAs, even RBTs. If you're not yet certified, you can't claim to have it. You can't claim to be a BCBA intern. You can't claim that I am one. I just need to pass my exam. None of these things. It's a specific ethical code that you are violating. Is it A, dual relationships? Does this have anything to do with crossing a professional to personal boundary? Not really, okay? Not what is happening here. B, do no harm to clients. Are you harming clients? By telling them this, you're not really harming clients, but they might start asking you to do things you might not be certified to do. C, do not discuss confidential information about your client. Are you discussing confidential information? No, you're just explaining incorrectly your title. And then D, do not misuse intellectual property of the BACB. So things like BCBA and RBT are the intellectual property of the BACB. If you misrepresent yourself by saying you're a BCBA, and when you're not, they consider that misusing their intellectual property. So what ethical code are you violating? D, do not misuse intellectual property of the BACB. Fantastic. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Join our YouTube membership if you'd like to support us further. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials. As always, work hard, study hard. I'll see you soon.